All right, so in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about reactions of aromatic compounds. If you can hear a noise in the background, that's my microwave. I'm sorry, I'm cooking my lunch right now, and it's going to beep here in 30 seconds, so don't be surprised when it beeps, because it will. So one question that we might want to ask ourselves is, um, after you've watched the last video about um, how you add particular electrophiles on to your benzene ring, what if you already have a substituent on your ring, and how does that affect how this other group get, how this other group adds on? So <laughs> from what you've seen before, HNO3 and H2SO4 are going to give you a nitro group on your ring. Okay, there's my nitro. Um, but the issue we have to take into account is, what does the bromine do? Or what does the aldehyde group do? Or what does the methoxy group here do? Because it's important to understand what these groups do. For bromobenzene, um, bromine does one thing in particular. And what it does is, it actually directs, and this is an important word, it directs placement of the nitro group into what's called the ortho and para positions. Now, you've seen ortho and para before when we talked about naming all of, of, of these guys. So essentially what we have here is, uh, this is our ortho isomer, and that's our para isomer. And it turns out that depending on what this group is, will determine where the other group goes. When we have this guy that has a different structure, we have, <coughs> here's our aldehyde group, and what we actually get is, first off, we only form one product, and what we get is substitution only in the meta position. And then when we go down here, um, we actually get two products again. And in this case, it's ortho and para. So one question is going to be, well, why? Um, what is going on to explain all that? Because obviously something must be happening. There's also one other thing that we will that we'll that we will talk about here. And I'll just mention it now. We'll talk about placement of the groups and where they go. We'll also talk about reactivity. The three reagents here are exactly the same. Nitration in each case. But the fact is there is there is an observed reaction trend here. And this one with the methoxy group, this ends up being the fastest reaction. With the aldehyde here, this is the slowest reaction. And this one, I'll use M for middle, this one is in the middle. So something about the methoxy group does two things. Speeds the reaction up and causes the nitro to go ortho and para. Something about bromine causes the same substitution but causes the reaction to be slower than when we have the methoxy and then with the aldehyde, we get that other substitution pattern and the reaction is very slow. So the whole point behind this video is, why? All right. All right, so first off, <clears throat> let's address the issue of speed. All right. We can do this by a simple classification system that fits most of our substituents. So let me draw out a benzene ring. Um, and your benzene ring, broadly, is going to have substituents that fit into one of two broad categories. Group one is going to be the group where you have an electronegative element, X, whatever that may be. X doesn't necessarily mean halogen here. It could be nitrogen, oxygen, whatever. With at least one pair of electrons on it. You can have more, but it needs at least one. And that atom is directly connected to the benzene ring. The other general group is groups that have a substituent that looks something like this. No matter what else is coming off this X, it at least has a double bond to Y, where the electronegativity of Y is greater than X. Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, for example. 
<clears throat> and there is no lone pair on this X, but there may be on this Y. The vast majority of our substituents are going to fit into that category. So, for example, um, bromine uh, phenol uh, let's do if I do nitrobenzene then I have to draw it out so you can see which one it fits so bromine put all the long pairs on there and you can see well, those are supposed to be long pairs. You can see which one that fits. It fits number one. Um, and then we have the OH, which also fits number one. And then the NO2, which you can see fits number two. So <clears throat> what this means is, like I said, each of our groups here can fit one of these two general structures. And determining how this affects the rate of the reaction the relative rate of the reaction and the orientation of the product is what we'll look at right now. When we have something with a pair of electrons right on that atom, can we draw out some resonance structures for what those electrons could do? Well, the fact is, yes, we could. We could funnel these electrons down into here and full funnel them into the ring. And I could draw out a bunch of resonance structures here. The important thing is that the electrons have been added into the ring. So what's happened to the electron density in my benzene ring? Well, it's increased. And if it's increased, what does that do to the nucleophilic nature of my benzene ring? Well, if I have more electrons in there, you need electrons to attack something. More electrons in the ring make it more nucleophilic. That's why the vast majority of groups that fit this structure increase the rate of the reaction. There's a couple of exceptions. So, for example, phenol fits group one. And in phenol, you can do that very thing. And phenol does indeed speed up, or phenol undergoes a faster reaction than benzene does. Now, let's look at this guy. Just as in one, you could funnel electrons in, we have a double bond here with Y that's more electronegative than X. And we can actually do the opposite. We can funnel electrons out of the ring up onto here. Let's see, and we get out um, one resonance structure. And again, we can draw out a bunch of them that would look. Oops, that's not N. What am I doing? It's too early in the morning. But it's 11.40, so it's not early. We have X. We have Y. Y is now going to have a negative charge on it. We have this, and we have this, and we have a positive charge here on our ring. So with these groups, we actually can remove electron density from the ring. So therefore, what does that do to the relative reactivity of something like this? Well, it makes the benzene ring less reactive. That is why your nitro groups, your benzaldehydes, your esters, your carboxylic acids, all those with the with the double bond oxo, with the double bond to something electronegative, end up being less reactive than just benzene. So we have two broad groups. Yeah? Those that are push electrons into the ring, and then those that take it out. Those that push electrons into the ring speed the rate of reaction up, and those are called activators, because they activate the ring. Those that pull electrons out slow the reaction down, so they're called deactivators. But everything I'm doing here is by resonance. And resonance isn't the only thing to consider. Because, uh, for example, this, when we look at the NO2 group, it's electron withdrawing by resonance. In other words, electrons can be pulled out of the ring. The other thing we have to think about is something called induction. Induction is simply a measure of essentially electronegativity. Nitrogen, oxygen, and oxygen are all more electronegative than carbon. So if this is the carbon that all these three are bound to, by induction, these, these three, particularly the nitrogen, pull electrons away from the benzene ring. So by induction, NO2 is electron withdrawing. It's also electron withdrawing by resonance. In phenol, 
oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So the OH is electron withdrawing by induction, but electron donating by resonance. The resonance effect is bigger because the group like this is an activator. The only example where this is not the case, where it's actually the opposite, and you will have seen this if you've looked in the book about it, the halogens, for some reason, are the only group that direct ortho para and yet are ring deactivators. Because usually something that's an activator is also an ortho para direct. So we would expect bromine fits this general structure with the lone pair here. By resonance, it shoves electrons into the ring. And yet it's still classified as a deactivator, so it reacts more slowly than benzene. So if it's electron donating by resonance, what must it be by induction? Well, bromine's much more electronegative than carbon, so it's electron withdrawing by induction, and it just turns out the induction is bigger than the resonance. That's why the reaction slows down. However, because it still has the resonance here, it still, do, uh, it still directs off a para, and we'll talk about that here in just a minute. So let's talk about <coughs> why some things are matter and some things are ortho para. Okay. I'm going to do some resonance structures here. Now, I'm going to show you something slightly different, well, more than slightly different, about um, more slightly different. It's different to what the book shows, but it illustrates the same concept. Okay? A group like OH here, we know that's an ortho para activator. What we're trying to explain right now is why it's ortho para. Okay? I'm going to push some electrons into this ring, so I'm going to push these onto here put those electrons right on there. All right, so we're going to draw up a ring. So I have this here. Don't worry about the fact that I have three bonds to oxygen. That's not the focus here. The focus is what's going on in the ring. I have a negative charge on this carbon. Now if I do another resonance structure, I take the electrons from that negative charge on that carbon, break that pi bond, and put them onto the para carbon at the bottom there. This is still the same. That there, that there, negative charge there. And I can do the same thing again. those electrons into there, kick those electrons up onto that carbon. And so what I come up with, I'm going to run out of room here, is I have this guy, that there, that there, that there, and that there. Notice <coughs> in all these resonance structures where the charges are located. The charges are located on those two ortho carbons, which is essentially the same, and then the one para carbon. Notice there's no way to put the charges on the meta carbons. So what that means is the ortho and para carbons are more nucleophilic than the meta carbons, and hence why you get substitution of the ortho and para position. Now, like I said, the book explains this in a slightly different way. Okay, more than a slightly different way, but um, that's essentially the uh, the nuts and bolts of it. Now, if we look at something like something that's a meta director, let's do well. Let's just do benzaldehyde. All right. We said already benzaldehyde is a Meta directing deactivator. But it's the meta directing business that we want to look at right here. So I'm going to try and show you some resonance structures to indicate why that's the case. So we're going to put this here, put that negative charge on the oxygen, put this here, this here. Now, what charge am I going to have on this carbon? Well, I'm pulling electrons out of the ring, so that's, that's actually going to be a plus charge here. Now let me do some resonance structures here. Move those arrows up into that. 
sigma bond or uh, to form a new pi bond there. And when I do that, what I end up with is, let me just draw this out here, I've got a minus, we've got this here, that there. Now I have this here, now I have my plus charge down here. And I can do the same thing again. So what that means, once I draw out the last structure here, This one, that goes here, that is there, that plus charge is here. So where are the plus charges on the ring? Well, the plus charges are on the ortho and para carbons, which means out of these one, two, three, four, five carbons, which of those carbons are the least nucleophilic? Well, it's the ones with the plus charge. So therefore, which carbons are the most nucleophilic? Well, it ends up being the two metacarbons. And that is why, for this sort of species, you get metadirection, and why, for this sort of species, you get orthopara direction. All right? that's, that's how that all works. So one of the other things that I want to talk about a little bit, too, is um, <coughs> You are going to see groups like, for example, methyl. Methyl is listed in the book as a orthopara activator. However, you will see it doesn't necessarily fit exactly with this one right here. However, it fits this one better than this one because there's no dual one there. Basically, one thing to remember here is if there is some sort of alkyl group on the benzene ring, it's an ortho para activator. It's, it's not a very strong activator. So for something like this with a lone pair, that's much more strong of an activator, but that's still an activator. And so in your book, you'll actually have a table of relative strengths of activating, deactivating, um, effects in all these groups and you'll have things like you'll have the ortho para activators you'll have the one example of ortho para deactivators and then you have your meta deactivators now the the ortho para deactivators the only examples of that are the halogens the uh, C, L, I, F, although these two don't really talk about too much. Also, pair activators, again, uh, is, is anything with something electronegative that has a pair of electrons on it directly connected to the ring. OH, um, OCH3. Um, you could have something like this, NH, CO. CH3, even though there is a double bond here, what's more important is directly connected to the ring is the lone pair on the nitrogen. Um, and there are plenty of others, but that's also where the alkyl groups also fit. It's just these are all stronger. And then for the meta deactivators, you have things like the NO2, the uh, CO2H, that they all have this double bond to something electronegative in their structure. All right. So, um, we saw that for the benzaldehyde. We'll see it for, say, for example, an ester. Um, and you'll also see it for something that has more than one pi bond, because here there's one pi bond, here there's one, here there's one. Here there's one, here there's two, but all you need is one. SL3H also fits that same group. So you can actually predict what's going to happen based on the structure of the group that's already on the ring.